Good evening, friends. I'm Homi Baba, and I direct the Mahindra Humanities Center here at Harvard in the company of wonderful friends and colleagues, many of whom are with us today. It's very much a collective and collaborative conversation. And indeed, this forum, this forum on the environment, has emerged out of that conversation. Every year, I like to um, feature both a new kind of theme or set of ideas at the Humanities Center, something that uh, challenges the um, norms that we deal with, something different at the center, to institutionalize the center around a set of new ideas. But for us, it has also been really important to find new ways, new forms, new fora for launching these ideas. So it's an attempt to both change the content and the form together. And you know that makes me a literary formalist, but uh, that, that's, that's what I am. Um, uh, the Environment Forum has been convened by Robin Kelsey and Ian Miller to very dear friends, Ian cannot be with us today uh, due to personal uh, family reasons, but we miss him and we really celebrate his presence. He's been a great en energetic uh, colleague and friend and he will of course come back and make his contribution. We also uh, launched last year another panel with Claire Massoud called Writers Speak. So we're trying now to set up these semi-autonomous panels, uh, of course, very much also in our friendly embrace. Um, and it gives me the greatest pleasure to have today the realization, the actualization of questions and issues and problems that we have been discussing at the Humanity Center, to try to find the right form, as I said earlier, and I think this is the the right form, and I think Terry Tempest Williams is the right voice to launch this form, and uh, I very much hope that we will develop this with the same energy that we have uh, today. But in setting up this uh, uh, forum, I also want to uh, remind you and to remember, in fact, colleagues of ours who have been working in the field of environment, in the field of climate change, in the humanities uh, for a long time, and who are clearly important voices for us to listen to and to uh, collaborate with as we set up this panel. And I think in particular here of uh, Larry Buell and my colleague Jim Engel, who is kindly here with us this evening. Um, <clears throat> I think uh, the hour of the land has come, and it, if we don't listen and if we don't reflect, I think we are in a very difficult position. Um, this Earlier in the summer, I was in Venice uh, with a few people working on the Habitat Charter of the UN, the, the new version of the Habitat Charter. And I have to say that the question of land became extraordinarily important. Who owns the land now? What forms of land speculation take place? How does land get depatriated by, uh, you know, by market forces? Lands are literally bought up. I mean, I believe a huge chunk, and I'm, you know, I'm sure you know this, a huge chunk of Detroit has been bought by the Chinese now. Huge. Large parts of the Caribbean are being bought up. So the whole question of land was very important. I, of course, come from a country, from India, from a city, Mumbai, where there is absolutely very little green space. It must be the least in the world. And these thoughts brought to me um, uh, 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 this afternoon brought to my mind a passage uh, by Hannah Arendt written for completely different purposes. She was writing about refugees. 
And I think, however, that this connection is not simply an accidental one. Because the cities, the lands, the places from which refugees leave are now very often uh, demolished by war, by deprivation. So I think that's another way of thinking about what our ecological or environmental ethics should be. I mean, the destruction in the world at the moment, the, a world that will have to be relived, land that will have to be re-nurtured. And in that context, I thought of this passage out of context, but I'm going to read it to you. Deadly danger to any civilization is no longer likely to come from without. No barbarians threaten to destroy what they cannot understand, as the Mongolians threatened Europe for centuries. Even the emergence of totalitarian governments is a phenomenon within and not outside our civilization. The danger is that a globally, universally interrelated civilization may produce barbaric practices from its own mist, midst by forcing millions of people into conditions which, despite all appearances, are the conditions of savagery. And I have taken this out of its original context, uh, from the origins of totalitarianism. While reading it, I have continually tweaked it and written it, I hope relevantly, for our discussion the danger from within, in our arrogance, in our vanity, in our certainty of knowing what we are doing, knowing where we want to go, what progress is. And with that, I leave you and thank you, Terry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Homie. Um, I'm just going to say uh, a few words um, about this evening, which is uh, a very special one uh, for me and I hope for everyone interested in uh, the environmental humanities at Harvard. Uh, it's a great moment to launch this initiative, uh, made possible by Homie's interest and generosity. Our gratitude is uh, equal to our delight in his uh, company over the, the weeks and months that we have uh, discussed this. It's an exciting moment generally because this is only one, as Homi indicated, one of multiple initiatives taking place right now in the environmental uh, humanities, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, that Professor uh, Joyce Chaplin and Laura Martin, who are conveniently sitting next to each other, uh, have uh, established the Environmental History Working Group at the Harvard University Center for the Environment uh, under the generous uh, sponsorship of its director, Dan Schrag, and that Professor Karen Thornber is launching an environmental humanities initiative focused on China at the Harvard Global Institute. Uh, so there's a lot that's happening that's exciting, and in this matrix of new programs, I think this forum has a very special uh, place. And I'd like to say a word or two about that. The reason that Ian and I uh, approached Professor Baba with the idea uh, for this forum was that we were not content with seeding conversations around the university with little sprinkles of uh, the humanities and what it might have to say about environmental issues, however important that sprinkling may be. We wanted to bring our environment to the center of conversations about what the humanities are and what they might be. In other words, our aim was not to bring the environment to the humanities as one more topic, but rather to ask what happens to the humanities when one takes the immensely challenging circumstances uh, that we face with respect to our environment as a starting point for asking what a humanist might do uh, in the world. To put this another way, we wanted to ensure that we recognized as an intellectual community that we cannot address the environmental conundrums 
we face without asking fundamental questions about who we as humans are, which are questions at the heart of uh, the humanities. As is the case of most good new things at Harvard, the form has been driven into existence by a younger generation that has been productively urging uh, the elders to pay attention to the most pressing issues uh, of the day. So I would like to pay my respects to that younger generation, but I would also uh, like to acknowledge again uh, Joyce Chaplin uh, personally because it was her very generous invitation to join Larry Buell and Joyce in directing a Warren Center uh, seminar that led to my interest in uh, initiating uh, this, uh, this forum. And, and uh, I would like to just echo what Homie said about wishing that Ian was here to tell his own story of his uh, in involvement, and he is certainly here in spirit. To launch this effort, Ian and I wanted someone with a vigorously independent uh, voice, someone who took deep thinking out into the world, someone who demonstrated what a humanist sensibility could mean for the practice of citizenship, someone of staunch integrity and brilliant insight who could model the shape of our ambition and its implications for action. In other words, we wanted Terry Tempest Williams. <laughs> Author of, among other books, uh, Refuge, An Unspoken Hunger, A Voice in the Wilderness, When Women Were Birds, Finding Beauty in a Broken uh, World, and most recently, The Hour of Land, Ms. Williams is a writer of gorgeous prose and deep conscience. And if you've read her work, you know this. And if you haven't, you have some lovely afternoons or evenings uh, ahead of you. Ms. Williams has garnered awards, distinctions, and accolades, but uh, if she will forgive me, I'd rather say something personal about my experience of reading her work. From that reading, I can tell you that I will never look at starlings or magpies, plastic forks or unused journals, to-do lists or prairie dogs the way I did before. From that reading, I have learned how vital it is to write oneself into the land so that one can find a place for one's own voice and how remarkable it is when that voice is equal to that land's marvels. From that reading, I have learned that the most pathetic fallacy is to think that you can keep the world voiceless and yet hospitable. From that reading, I have learned how a romantic conception of the world can coexist, reconciled and unreconciled with the hard facts about ourselves. From that reading, I have learned that you can be a nature writer with the desert in your bones, and yet deliver an abundance of insights into the most social of things, insights into families, into the weight of generations, and into the risk that any meaningful personal freedom requires. And I could go on, but let me offer you the much sweeter pleasure of getting to know the source of my lessons. Please join me in welcoming a great writer and a great person and a perfect speaker to launch our initiative this evening, Terry Tempest Williams. Thank you, Robin. I'm nervous. I'll get over it. Um, so I want you to bear with me. Uh, thank you, Robin. It's such a pleasure and privilege to be here this evening. Um, I so appreciate your invitation to be part of this launch of environmental humanities. From what I can tell and the research of just um, my own curiosity of what's happening at Harvard, it's happening. Uh, whether it's the center of the environment or what you were referencing with history, um, what's happening here in this extraordinary um, form at the Mahindra Center, um, I'm really honored to be here. And thank you, Homi Baba. 
thank you for that chilling reminder of savagery. And I wanted to ask you, so I don't forget, you talked about lives relived and land re, re nurtured. I don't want to forget that because I think that's exactly where we are. And some of the most powerful, poignant conversations I've had have been in anticipation of this conversation today. And thank you, Robin um, and Ian, for your faith, um, for um, allowing someone from the outback, so to speak, in Utah to come here. And uh, I'm, I'm honored to be able to um, build the bridges between the intellectual rigor within the academy and student engagement on the ground in the service of communities, both human and wild, I think is essential. And I agree with you. I think the next generation is demanding it. And it is our call and pressure to listen. I also want to acknowledge Ian Miller and um, my prayers are with, with, with Ian and his family. And thank you, Sarah Razor and Jill Redskin for the conversations that we've been having. I think that environmental humanities allow us to see the world whole. And I see two of my former students, um, Andrew Nalani and Carrie Rosenblum, and you have been my teachers. Um, I see Tim to Christopher, and you are my teacher. And it's this next generation that it makes me appreciate what Thoreau said in Walden when he said, I'm 30 years old, and my seniors have yet to teach me anything. And it makes me smile. I think our task as educators is to create an environment, an atmosphere, where students can flourish with what they already know and intuit by being alive at this moment in time. Environmental humanities can support them with a type of ground truthing. Hands on the earth, we remember where the source of our power lies. And it is deeply humbling. Just for my own sense, so I know where you are, would students please stand so we can honor you? Yeah, there you go. Thank you. I just like to know where, where the weight is. Uh, ours is a storied world. Um, story is the umbilical cord between the past, present, and future. It keeps things known. I think when someone tells a story, it's... Uh, <laughs> We become accountable for that knowledge which is shared. Story becomes the conscience of the community. Environmental humanities is the correspondence between the, the inner and outer landscapes uh, where deep listening occurs. And I see this kind of engagement here at Harvard. Um, just with my own uh, friends, I think about the work that Sharon uh, Harper is doing as a photographer with the national parks, whether it's looking at the presence of, of glacial erratics or the intricacy of uh, desert plants and how they speak to one another. Um, Linda Bilms, um, her research on national parks and our call to figure out how to fund them, um, a call for an endowment and with her research showing that $90 billion a year um, could come from a small tax that in her research shows that um, citizens are willing to do to protect and preserve our national parks three times what our Congress has said yes to. At a time where this huge advertising has gone on with Find Your Park, now how are we going to pay for them? That research is going on here. Or the beloved work of, of Ed Wilson, um, who now is one of our elders um, and has been for a long time as far as I'm concerned. I remember meeting him as a student at the University of Utah and I'll never forget asking him as a 20 year old, Dr. Wilson, are you hopeful? And he said, no, but I'm optimistic. Just keep doing the work. I've never forgotten that. And now in his 80s, as he tells us, if we as a species are to survive, half the earth is required. Half the earth protected in wildness is required so that we can 
have lives relived and land re-nurtured. This is what's at stake. And I hold the words of Calestis Juma, another mentor of mine, um, at the Kennedy School when he uh, last month was saying to me, we may in fact be ungovernable, the world right now, and that our only hope is if we return, not go back, but return to a renewed sense of community where the ethic of place and of caring for one another returns in our governance. And I think of the work his wife is doing, Allison, in the wild stretches of river here along um, the watersheds of the, the Concord and Merrimack River. So wherever we live, wherever our sense of place is, wherever our ethic of place resides, whether it's along the banks of the Charles River or facing the Atlantic Ocean, or in my case, the Great Salt Lake and Inland Sea, uh, a mirage in the desert, water in the desert that nobody can drink, that kind of paradox. These are the places that infuse our spirit with a deeper sense of morality. So we're here tonight to, to celebrate these things. And I would argue that we are here because of love. And I don't know how that word sits here at Harvard, but I imagine we're all sitting here with that word. A love of knowledge, a love of place, a love of our students, a love of our material, a love of each other. And I think um, that's really what I want to talk about tonight, to be here um, because of love, um, to act in the name of love, to be part of a community, as Aldo Leopold reminds us, that is not just our own species, but rocks, rivers, plants, animals, and human beings, to see the world whole, even holy. <coughs> it's the notion to see ourselves um, as one species among many. We are not the center of the universe. <coughs> I think we forget that. Our national parks, I would argue, are a gateway into the intersection of the human and the wild, where for many of us, our sense of an ecology of residency resides. I would suggest that collaboration is the way forward. And so tonight, um, as I share these remarks for the next hour, it may be less, um, I would ask each of us to consider how do we take the gifts that are ours and give them up in the name of community, each in our own way, each in our own time with the gifts that are ours, to protect these lands as breathing spaces. This morning, um, Brooke and I went to the Pusey Museum, where, as you know, there's this fantastic exhibit um, called The Land Remains, A Century of Conservation of America's National Parks with maps. How many of you have seen the exhibit? You have something to look forward to. <laughs> um, it's amazing, and I can't wait to go back tomorrow. I think it's important, and we were able to see through the lenses of David Weimer, the librarian for the geographic, um, the cart cartographic collections, um, and Scott Walker, who curated the, sh um, the show with Bonnie Burns. In one map, I promise you, of, of Yellowstone National Park, and this is where Brooke and I are living, in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem right now, in one map, it's everything I needed to know about the power of perceptions. It was a map that was created um, through the Hayden Expedition, 1871, of the Geyser Basin. Um, if someone were to say, you know, what is environmental humanities? How about the Hayden Expedition? How about Thomas Moran as artist? How about William Jackson as photographer? How about the cast of, of luminaries in the, the sciences, biology, um, collecting specimens, the geologists and uh, Hayden himself. And I love that there were 32 uh, mappists who were making not an aerial point of view that we have now of Yellowstone, but, but really 
looking on the ground. And don't ask me how with the, the tools that they did created something so accurate. The four of us this, this, this morning were just in awe um, of, of what collaboration can be on the land and in the world. Um, not only just mapping new territory, but mapping the imagination with that point of view. And just last week I was in Jackson, Wyoming and listened to Bob Smith, who's the leading authority on seismic mapping right now. And I can't wait to have him go back and look at Hayden's map and see um, the overlay and how what is the connective tissue of, of a map in the 21st century and a map in the 19th century. It is the imagination. The stories. Um, while we were there, uh, there was a brother and sister um, who every map was an ignition of stories. And I think this is what um, the environmental humanities do for us. It's also what our national parks are for us. They are memory palaces, the stories that we tell ourselves. Not just one story, but multiple stories. 300 million visitations occur over a year, and it's rising. Why? I think it, because we are increasingly losing our breaths, and they are the breathing spaces that remind us, once again, where the source of our power comes from. Not just human, but wild. There was a map of Yosemite, and it was very near the map of Yellowstone. And I couldn't help but think of President Obama and the speech that he delivered in June in Yosemite to celebrate the centennial of our national parks. I was not prepared for his joy. He was the first president of the United States to come back to Yosemite um, for over 50 years. The last president to visit Yosemite National Park was, was John F. Kennedy. You can imagine a security nightmare, right? He came and he spoke. And what I loved, and this was maybe a week after the mass murders in Orlando, he spoke with such conviction and it was clear that he moved off the prepared texts. And he said, this is what I want to say to you. Can you imagine what it was like for a boy of 11 living in Hawaii on an island to come to the mainland and have my mother take me to the place she felt was most important for me to see, Yellowstone. He said, can you imagine what it was like to see a moose knee deep in a pond? Or to turn a corner and see golden meadows with deer? And at the close of the day, to see a grizzly with two cubs? He said, it changes you. It changes me. And it reminds me, he said, as Yosemite reminds me, that we are part of so much, something so much greater than ourselves. That is our president right now, speaking about the national parks. And I love, and I think it's important for us to recognize that he has now surpassed Teddy Roosevelt as our conservation president. That now he has protected over 265 million acres of land and water. I think that matters. Again, a stay against savagery. Our national parks are blood. All over the world, this is true. They are more than scenery. They are portals and thresholds of wonder, an open door that swings back and forth from our past to our future. This something we call America lives not so much in political institutions as in its rocks and skies and seas, wrote the photographer Paul Strand. This is the hour of land, when our mistakes and shortcomings must be placed in the perspective of time. The hour of land is where we remember what we have forgotten. We are not the only species who lives and breathes and loves on this planet. There is something enduring that circulates in the heart of nature that deserves our respect and attention. This was my intent in writing The Hour of Land. And what I want you to know is that my stories are rooted in the American West. This is my home ground. I live in a state a contentious state, I will say, um, called Utah, in the Red Rock Desert, where our five national parks, Zion, Bryce, uh, 
Capitol Reef, Arches, Canyonlands, I've always viewed as our backyard. And I hope you'll forgive me if I share a story. Um, it happens young. And I would urge you to think about, you know, what is your mother park? What are your earliest memories of, of a landscape that held you? And for me, it's this. Um, I grew up in the Mormon religion. We had a ritual that when you turned eight years old that you were about to be baptized. Uh, you climbed Mount Timpanogos, and you made your way to the top of Timpanogos by way of Timpanogos Cave, which is a national monument. And I remember there must have been 12 of us, eight years old. Uh, we followed our teacher up a, a steep mile and a half um, paved trail. I remember the big metal green doors opening. There was a park ranger to meet us. We walked up on risers, moving through Father Time's jewel box, um, through the Valley of Sleep. All I could think of was, where is the great heart of Timpanogos? Because we were raised with the story um, it was a Ute story that the heart of the maiden was here. So a child of eight years old took that literally. Um, and I just kept looking for the great heart. We turned, the temperature dropped, there was the great heart, dripping. I wondered if I were to touch it, would it register as cold or heat? I swear it was beating. I became so obsessed with the great heart before me, the stalactites, stalagmites that registered his teeth. Here was this heart, this beating heart in the center of the mountain, that when the lights turned off and the door closed and I was left inside the mountain with such a depth of darkness, I have never been able to duplicate. There I was, lost, found, I can't tell you when fear transformed itself into awe. I also can't tell you how long it was that I was inside that dark center of the mountain. But when the doors opened and the lights went on, I was sorry. And for the rest of my life, I've been looking for that heart, that beating heart, the depth of that mountain. In the centennial year of our beloved national parks, there's much to celebrate and much to protect in the political climate of today. Bernard DeVoto, who is a writer I seek in these times in the interior west, when if you read the GOP uh, platform, the language is, quote, to dispose of all public lands to dispose of all federal lands, unquote. I think that should concern all of us. Devoto wrote in 1951 on America's public lands, you had better watch this now and from now on. The land grabbers are on the loose again, and they can only be stopped only as they were before by the effective marshalling of public opinion. That was in 1951. 2016, it's the same story. The stakes are just higher. Public lands, that's what I want to talk about today. That's what's fueling the American West. And when I'm in the East, I'm very mindful that a lot of people don't care about the public lands. A lot of people don't even know what public lands are. And I will never forget a few years ago, a friend of mine, um, Bill Hedden, who graduated from Harvard, he was part of the Back to the Land movement, went into um, Castle Valley where we live now in Salt Lake, a hamlet in the desert of 300 people. We were in New York, we were on Madison Avenue, we were just coming out of the Whitney Museum, and he said, you know, Terry, nobody cares about public lands. And I said, oh, yes, they do. Um, and he said, I'll bet you. He said, I bet you cannot find one out of 10 people in this city that even know what public lands are. And I said, okay, you're on. And he said, I'll bet you $100. I needed the money. So we went and asked the first person, excuse me, can you tell me what the BLM is? We thought that would be the marker, the Bureau of Land Management, who is the largest federal landholder in the country. I asked the first person, could you tell me what the BLM is? And he said, is it a car? I asked the second person, is it a disease, uh, a center for disease? And airlines, today it would be Black Lives Matter. 
Um, we went all the way through. No one could tell us what the BLM was. We were down to nine. I was losing. I'm not a good loser. I scoured the last one very, very carefully. And across the road, I saw a young woman wearing turquoise jewelry, and I thought, that one. <laughs> and I ran across through several, several cabs, um, grabbed her, and said, excuse me, can you tell me what the BLM is? And she said, you mean the Bureau of Land Management? I work for them. <laughs> and then the next thing was instructive. She said, am I in trouble? <laughs> so for those of us, um, who worry about our public lands, that is a statement. Uh, in 1955, Wallace Stegner, whom I love, the same era as Devoto, wrote this, right when Dinosaur National Monument was threatened by the Bureau of, Le uh, of Reclamation, um, building a hydroelectric dam that would choke the Yampa and Green Rivers. This is what he wrote. It is a better world with some buffalo left in it, a richer world with some gorgeous canyons unmarred by signboards, hot dog stands, superhighways, or high tension lines, undrowned by power or irrigation reservoirs. If we preserved as parks only those places that have no economic possibilities, we would have no parks. And in the decades to come, it will not only be the buffalo and the trumpeter swan who need sanctuaries, our own species is going to need them too. It needs them now. As you know, the dam was never built. Today, six decades later, um, the monument remains an oasis of calm. The rivers are free flowing. And the signs of the Fremont people um, who once had inhabited these desert lands are still there. And the Ute people still inhabit those lands. It's in a boom or bust cycle. Now it's a bust cycle. And the people are wondering what to do with their new houses, their new trucks, and no wages to support them. 40 of our national parks in America are threatened by oil and gas development. 12 of our national parks already have oil and gas development in them, with 30 parks now threatened. Theodore Roosevelt National Park among them. The very park, the very lands in the Badlands of North Dakota that Teddy Roosevelt said allowed him to develop the character to become President of the United States, the same lands that healed him after his wife and mother died on the same day when he put an X in his journal, the light has gone out of my life. Those lands are now threatened, right in the shadow of the Bakken oil fields that in its prime two years ago was producing one million barrels a day. As we mark the centennial of the National Park Service, my question is this, what is the relevance of our national parks in the 21st century? And how might these public commons bring us back home to a United States of humility? So when I was thinking about our parks, how they really are a gateway drug to our public lands, which is what I really care about, I thought about a dinner party. Um, I thought, Brooke and I in the desert, we have a fair amount of them. And we have 12 chairs around our table. So I thought, OK, if I were to invite 12 national parks to dinner, which ones would they be? <laughs> so I knew who would be at the head of the table. My mother park, which is Grand Teton National Park, and Canyonlands National Park, which is very near where we live. I thought about who would be at the center of the table that would keep the conversation going. Um, parks that I didn't know well, but I really trusted. Acadia National Park and Theodore Roosevelt National Park, um, both with familial ties. Then I thought about the dream guest that I would never dare invite, but I knew other people who would. And those would be the parks I'd never been to before. Um, Big Bend in Texas, which by the way, if I ever disappear, that's where it'll be. Um, and Gates of the Arctic in Alaska, above the Arctic Circle, the least visited national park within the system. And then I thought about the bad boys and girls, um, the people you love to have at the dinner party, but they don't really behave very well. And that would be Gettysburg, Alcatraz, Gulf Island National Seashore, the ideas they bring, slavery, war, incarceration, 
the BP oil spill. I thought about the complicated guest whose family that you really don't want to invite, but you have to because you don't know if you're up to them, and that was Glacier National Park. I didn't know if I could tell the story of the complicated, violent history of the National Park Service and the Blackfoot Nation. I didn't know how to convey the notion that the very namesake of Glacier National Park, that the glaciers are disappearing, now 15 remain. Glacier was at the dinner table. There was the unexpected guest, Effigy Mounds National Monument in Iowa. <coughs> How many of you have been to Effigy Mounds? I had never even heard of it either. Honestly, one of the top five pl places I've ever been in my life. Effigy Mounds in the shapes of marching bears, 10 bears in a row lining the ridge, a falcon effigy mound, 200-foot wingspan, a Lakota man who's now the cultural resource manager took us there, a holy place. Most all of the effigy mounds have been plowed under, replaced by corn. And then the guest that changed everything Cesar Chavez, National Monument. And it was in that moment around the dinner table I realized that my mentor, whom I adore, who I took almost everything he said as gospel truth, Wallace Stegner, that, that our national parks were our best idea. I wish he were alive today so I could say, really, Wally? I'm not sure I agree. What about an evolving idea? If you think about 2016, 100 years past, 1916, Stephen Mather, the first National Park director, a moneyed man, a privileged man, a white man, made his fortune from borax 20 mules strong. His concerns were how can we get other people to pay for these parks. His concern about Yosemite National Park was, would Mrs. Astor be comfortable camping there? She wasn't. And so they built the Awani Hotel, named, ironically, after the very people the park displaced. Fast forward, 2016, the Awani name has been removed because of a court case, a battle over trademarks. Forget the Native people. An evolving idea. That is a shadow side. The other side of an evolving idea with our national parks is we now have a black president who was a community organizer who in 2012 honored another community organizer, Cesar Chavez, who in his term, we see the shifting demographics within our national parks. Harriet Tubman, Underground Railroad National Monument. Stonewall National Monument, looking at the struggle and the triumph of the LGBT community. The Woman's House in Washington, D.C. And now in Utah, in a state with such contentiousness around oil and gas development, the tribes are rising up. And the Navajo, the Hopi, the Zuni, and the two Ute nations, along with 25 Pueblo nations, are asking the president to please protect close to two million acres of their home ground adjacent to Canyonlands National Park in the Bears Ears National Monument. They are saying these lands are sacred. These are the lands where our ancestors' bones are buried. These are the lands where we can still hear their songs on the, the voice of the wind, where their ceremonies are held, where their medicines are gleaned. I think it will happen. And what an extraordinary healing for the United States government to honor the voices of indigenous people in place. An evolving idea. What I have learned is that there is no such thing as one portrait or one story, only the authority of our own experiences shared. Again, the stories. But here's, here's the thing. It wasn't until I read Jory Graham's 
poem, we, that I really saw how these individual pieces came together. And I think it's so important that in this idea of, of both our national parks as breathing spaces and environmental humanities, that we see how different artists, different scholars, different thinkers, different disciplines influence us. And in her poem, We, that I read just by accident, it was the January edition um, issue in, in uh, 2015, the last thing I grabbed as I was going to write for six weeks, that it was her poem that gave me the bones I needed, the scaffolding to build, to create the Hour of Land. And what I will tell you is that I built this book differently. Because suddenly, a sense of place became a poetics of place that gave rise to an ethic of place. And I want to read you the 13 lines that Jory, who is one of your colleagues, as you know, um, allowed me to use in her extraordinary generosity. By definition, keep promise. All this is what the wind knows. The stones, the steel, the galaxies. There is no prevailing. Death, yes, but as a gathering. Any wind will tell you. There is no private space. What more shall we do to others, to otherness? We are in some strange wind, says the wind. The bodies are all gone from it. The purchases have been made. It is so extreme, this taking the place of, this standing in for, this disappearing of all the witnesses. I say to myself, keep on. It will not be the end. Not yet. Thirteen lines from a very long poem by Jory Graham, gave me the legs to stand on. Keep promise. I want to read with you an excerpt from my mother park, Grand Teton National Park, and I would ask you to think about what is yours. Bless you. On my father's 80th birthday, we saw a bear, a grizzly standing upright, we had just hiked to Grand View Point in Grand Teton National Park, where Emma Matilda Lake and Two Ocean Lake appear below. And if you turn around, the glory of the Teton Range looms behind you. We were a party of four generations, the youngest just one year old, and we were resting at the base of the trail when the grizzly appeared. Instead of being afraid, we stood, as the bear did, trying to get a better look at the elusive beast. The bear bolted into the woods, gone. My niece smiled and looked to her grandfather. Happy birthday, John. Like so many families, our family has been coming to the Tetons for generations. Grand Teton National Park was a cherished landscape for my great-grandfather, John Henry Tempest Sr. He passed his affection for this place onto my grandfather, John Henry Tempest Jr., who passed it on to his sons, John and Richard, who passed it on to us, and another two generations past mine. Our entire Tempest clan can be found here most summers, climbing peaks, hiking trails, and cherishing the wildflowers and wildflower, wildflowers and wildlife, knowing each species by name. Our national parks are memory palaces where our personal histories reside. All you need to know is that my father in college, was his nickname was Teton Tempest. <laughs> Not long ago, my father and I were hiking to Taggart Lake, a short, lovely walk to the base of the Tetons. As we walked up the trail, we heard a horn blow repeatedly. Around the bend, a man in a Harvard sweatshirt, half crazed with fear, was holding a bear horn out in front of him. Pressing the button every 15 seconds or so, a large canister of bear spray hung low from his belt and numerous bear bells dangled from his backpack. <laughs> he looked, excuse me, like a one-man marching band the expression on his face when he met us head on was one of sheer terror. Good God, man, my father said. You look like you belong in the circus, not in the Tetons. I've been hiking this trail for 70 years and never seen a bear on it yet. Cut the horn. I forget what the hiker 
said in response, but I do recall my father's parting comment. If I were you, I wouldn't advertise where you went to school. <laughs> As you know, uh, the great philanthropist uh, John D. Rockefeller had much to do with Grand Teton National Park in the same way he had a lot to do with Acadia and many others. Um, again, wrought with paradox, standard oil, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Promises keep, Jory Graham's line. Um, I think a vow was made when John D. Rockefeller was invited out to Yellowstone National Park by Horace Albright, who was the first superintendent of Yellowstone, not long after those maps were made in the Hayden, uh, by the Hayden survey. Um, immediately, John D. Rockefeller recognized that it wasn't just the Tetons that needed protectin protecting rock and ice, but the entire valley with a meandering river called the Snake, wolves, bears, bison, all of it. And what they did surreptitiously was set up um, the Snake River Land Company and quietly bought up all the lands around what is now Grand, Grand Teton National Park. You can imagine what that did to the locals. Um, they were outraged. There was a man named Cliff Hansen who later became senator and governor of the state of Wyoming, led a stampede in protest saying, how dare you take our lands. Um, when our boys are fighting for these lands during World War II. Again, the irony, never mind the native people. Um, this is this history. Uh, he told FDR, either you take these lands or I'm gonna turn them over to the developers. FDR created a national monument, not so unlike what Obama just did with Roxanne Quimby and bears, birds, bees in the um, Katahdin, uh, Woods and Waters National Monument just last month. Anyway, Lawrence Rockefeller, son of John D., who was doing all the financial arrangements in this transaction, said to his father, can't we keep the most beautiful peace for ourselves? And John D. said, no, they belong to the American people. He pleaded, he won, but somewhere I think a vow was made and a promise kept that when Lawrence Rockefeller was in his early 90s, he decided the family had had those lands long enough, the same lands that every president, every diplomat, every notable had been to the JY Ranch at the base of Death Canyon. And at 92, sent out a letter to his children and kin and said, we've had these lands long enough. And a giant rewilding project occurred. All 40 plus cabins were cataloged curated and removed, rewilded, and today you can go to those lands and never know that a distinguished American family once went there for leisure. Promises kept. The scales of nature will always seek equilibrium. A feather can tip the balance. The Lawrence Rockefeller Preserve was dedicated on June 21st, 2008. Mr. Rockefeller's daughter, Lucy Rockefeller Waletsky, said, my father recognized mind, body, spirit as one word. My own father was among the first visitors in Grand Teton National Park to see the eastern shore of Phelps Lake when it was finally open to the public. As a man who has walked most of the trails in the Tetons, he walked the newly marked trail in awe, never imagining that this path would one day be open to him too. The Lawrence Rockefeller Preserve has become his favorite place in the Tetons. We've walked it together well over a dozen times, and each time we've gleaned something new, a patch of columbines, a doe and her fawns, an unexpected headstone among pines. The Rockefellers shared their wealth. Our public lands, whether a national park or monument, wildlife refuge, forest or prairie, make each one of us land rich. It is our inheritance as citizens of a country called America. In the summer of 2014, Lawrence Rockefeller's youngest brother, David, the last living child of John D. Rockefeller, Jr., returned to the restored shores of Phelps Lake, 
Gone were the horse stables, the cabins, and the lodge. Wild gardens of columbines and paintbrush extended down to the lake shore. Sitting in a wheelchair, one year shy of 100, David Rockefeller looked out across Phelps Lake toward Death Canyon, with tears streaming down his cheeks. The Tetons are my mother park. Not a year of my life has passed without the Tetons' jagged presence, not one. I am of this place. Family is a place, and my family is located here. Those who are living and those who have passed. I'm settled in the scent of sage. After we'd been gifted by the sight of the grizzly on my father's birthday, John Tempest picked up his great-grandson Wyatt and held him. Did you see that big bear, little man? Later that day, Wyatt would take his first awkward steps toward the extended hands of his great-grandfather on his 80th birthday. He would not know it then, but one day he'd be told that the day he learned to walk was the day he saw a grizzly standing upright in the presence of family. Four generations that will be followed by four more, and four more beyond that. This is what we can promise the future, a legacy of care, that we will be good stewards and not take too much or give back too little, that we will recognize wild nature for what it is in all its magnificent and complex history, an unfathomable wealth that should be consciously saved, not ruthlessly spent. Privilege is what we inherit by our status as homo sapiens living on this planet. This is the privilege of imagination. What we choose to do with our privilege as a species is up to us. Humility is born in wildness. We are not protecting grizzlies from extinction. They are protecting us from the extinction of experience. The very presence of a grizzly returns us to an ecology of awe. We tremble at what appears to be a dream, yet stands before us on two legs and roars. These words have been removed from the new version of the Oxford Gen Junior Dictionary. Acorn, adder, almond, apricot, ash, ass, beaver, beech, beetroot, blackberry, bloom, bluebell, bramble, brook, buttercup, boar, bullock, canary, canter, carnation, catkin, cauliflower, chestnut, clover, cowslip, crocus, cheetah, colt, cygnet, doe, drake, ferret, goldfish, heron, herring, kingfisher, lark, Lobster, leopard, magpie, minnow, mussel, newt, otter, ox, oyster, panther, pelican, porcupine, porcupine, porpoise, raven, stork, terrapin, thrush, weasel, wren, dandelion, fern, fungus, gooseberry, hazelnut, heather, holly, horse, chestnut, ivy, lavender, leek, Melon, minnow, monarch, holly, ivy, mistletoe, nectar, pasture, poppy, primrose, prune, radish, rhubarb, spinach, sycamore, tulip, turnip, vine, violet, walnut, willow. Gone. Removed. These are the words that have been added. Blog, broadband, MP3 player, voicemail, attachment, database, export, chat room, bullet point, cut and paste, analog, Celebrity with a capital C. Vandalism, negotiate, conflict, common sense, debate, EU, drought, brainy, boisterous, cautionary tale, bilingual, bungee jumping, committee, com compulsory, cope, democratic, allergic, biodegradable, emotion, dyslexic, donate, endangered, euro, apparatus, food chain, incisor, square number, trapezium, colloquial, idiom, curriculum, classify, chronological block graph. And when the editor was asked why, she said, we took out these words because they were no longer relevant or part of our children's lives. If we can remove words from a dictionary that are so alive with meaning and withhold them from our children, removing what is alive in the world becomes easy. The wild is no longer part of our vocabulary. I hear the poet W.S. Merwin's words, 
Through all of youth, I was looking for you without knowing what I was looking for. Nature becomes a forgotten language. These are difficult times, transformative times, times of extreme actions, especially within our national parks and public lands. Extreme drought, extreme fires, extreme development with extreme policy shifts needed in the name of climate change. The world is changing dramatically, both ecologically as well as politically. But I believe our greatest transformation as a species will be spiritual. The word we must include all species. Last fall, I was able to go to the Parliament of World Religions in Salt Lake City, and I was so moved by the religious scholar Karen Armstrong, who talked about compassion as an act, not an emotion. And she said, if compassion was an emotion, it would be most closely aligned with discomfort. Think about that. And I started thinking about discomfort, holy disruption, sacred discomfort, disturbance as a transformative act of a new evolving story. What would that look like? What would that feel like? And I think this kind of discomfort, disturbance, and holy disruption, this kind of leadership is actually very alive here at Harvard. What if the act of divestment is really an act of compassion? And I want to honor the students here at this university who are making this administration uncomfortable. This, too, is a breathing space. This, too, is part of an ecology of residency. And we can no longer separate the concerns of this generation with the vitality of our public lands even our national parks, especially when you hear the current director of the national parks say our greatest th threat, the greatest threat to our national parks and public lands, which is really us, is climate change. And so I honor you, Tim De Christopher, who was my companion at Alcatraz, who showed me the relationship between confinement and creativity in whatever forms that may take. Thank you, Tim, for your leadership of the heart. How you make us uncomfortable, even as you see the trench of a pipeline as an anticipatory grave, an analog to other anticipatory graves as we saw in Pakistan, in the deadly heat of drought before there were even the dead to fill them, and that you were not afraid to make us uncomfortable and to be arrested once again in the name of an ethic of place. I think it honors all of us that you are at the Divinity School here. I saw Chloe Max Maxman, another one of your students who led Divest Harvard. I saw her power of discomfort and persuasion in Paris, in the climate talks. As she was part of Sustain Us, the youth group of the United Nations. And I see and recognize the fierce commitment of you, Kelsey Worth, with mothers out in front. Again, these are not disparate issues, but they are the same response to life. We are here because of love, a stay against savagery. Sacred rage, that's something I would love to get into in environmental humanities. How do we take our love, a love that is wild, and put it into action? How do we take what is abstract in the academy and make it real, blood real, breathing spaces? I want to close with a thought and then a story. We the people have made mistakes We've made mistakes in our relationships with those who came before us and the land that holds their histories. We have made mistakes in how we've managed and misunderstood the wild. But after spending a lifetime immersed in our national parks and public lands, 
I have found we are slowly learning what it means to behave more respectfully and responsively to the closest thing we have as American citizens to sacred lands. We have much to learn from the native people. Prayers have to be walked, not just talked, Regina Lopez White Skunk said, who is Navajo. At the intersection of landscape and culture, diversity and inclusion, patterns of cooperation emerge in the name of community. Collaboration is the way forward. We are at a crossroads. We can continue on the path we've been on in this nation that privileges profit over people and land, or we can unite as citizens with a common cause, the health and wealth of the earth that sustains us. If we cannot commit to this kind of fundamental shift in our relationship to people and place, then democracy becomes another myth perpetuated by those in power who care only about themselves. We have arrived at the hour of land. The time has come for acts of reverence and restraint on behalf of the earth. Cesar Chavez said, quote, after 30 years of organizing poor people, I have become convinced that the two greatest aspirations of humankind are equality and participation. If we can learn to listen to the land, then we can learn to listen to one another. This is the beginning of ceremony. I want to close with three pages that are the last three pages in the book, and then we can open it up for questions. It is time to weep and sing, wrote W. H. Auden. At a, low ebb of, at a low ebb of hope, I asked my friend Doug Peacock how he staves off despair. This is the man who kept a map of Yellowstone in the back pocket of his fatigues throughout the Vietnam War. This is the man who the writer Edward Abbey fashioned George Washington Hayduke after, who eventually blew up the Glen Canyon Dam. Insulate yourself with friends and seek out wild places, he said, which is exactly what I was doing, seeking out my friend on the other side of Yellowstone on the day we learned that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service had denied wolverines protection under the Endangered Species Act. While driving from Jackson Hole to Livingston, Montana, I was listening to Vivaldi's Four Seasons, recomposed by the musician Max Richter. I love this piece of music and I love the story behind it. Richter's favorite piece of music was Vivaldi's Four Seasons. He had played it as a musician hundreds of times and heard it many more times than he'd ever performed it. But the strangest thing started to occur. The Four Seasons had become so commercialized, so trivialized, played in elevators and as the soundtrack for cheap commercials, that he could no longer hear its beauty. It had become lost to him, demoted to musical wallpaper. Max Richter did the unthinkable. He reimagined Vivaldi's masterpiece and recomposed it so we could hear it once again at this moment in time. He added the bass notes. The Four Seasons, he said, is something we all carry around with us. It's everywhere. In a way, we stop being able to hear it. So this project was about reclaiming this music for me personally, he said. I wanted to fall in love with it all over again. By getting inside it and rediscovering it for myself, I was able to take a new path through a well-known landscape." Unquote. I was listening to the Four Seasons Recomposed as I was en route to Doug. My mind was moving toward reverie with the music. It was exactly what I needed to recompose myself as I was driving through Yellowstone to Montana, inspiring me to reimagine everything, including our national parks. Our institutions and agencies are no longer working for us. It is time to reimagine our universities, our churches, our hospitals, our governments, even the wilderness movement as a movement of direct action. Time to reimagine our public lands as sanctuaries, refuges, and sacred lands. Time to rethink what is acceptable and what is not. I became lost in the music, and then, as I was driving through the Hayden Valley, the cars in front of me came to an abrupt halt, bison jam. The bison, hundreds of them, not only crossed the road, but walked alongside us. I was now to crawl 
barely going five miles per hour. I rolled down my window, still listening to the Four Seasons, with the volume much louder than I realized. The bison started moving closer to my car. I started getting nervous, thought about rolling up my window, but then I began noticing the bison turning their heads toward the music, walking even closer to the car. I imagined they were enjoying Vivaldi as I was, and I relaxed as we listened to the music together for close to a mile, all of us, slowly, moving down the road. I was late to Doug's house. He was waiting. I brought him a nice French Bordeaux. We took the bottle and two glasses outside with a view of Paradise Valley. Doug had written a plea on the Wolverine's behalf a week before. It was published online in the Daily Beast. He'd received a note from his editor, Chris Dickey, the son of the poet James Dickey. I'm sorry, Chris said. Perhaps this poem from my father will help. Under a thunderous sky with bolts of lightning adding punctuation, Doug and I read for the last Wolverine, out loud to each other, between sips of wine, alternating between stanzas, with tears streaming down our cheeks. The final lines undid us. Alone, with maybe some dim racial notion of being the last, but none of how much your unnoticed going will mean, how much the timid poem needs the mindless explosion of your rage, the glutton's internal fire, the elk's heart in the belly, sprouting rings, the pact of the blind swallowing thing with himself, to eat the world and not be driven off of it until it is gone, even if it takes forever. I take you as you are and make of you what I will, skunk bear, carcajoy, bloodthirsty non-survivor. Lord, let me die, but not die out. Doug and I raised our glasses to the mountains, black clouds billowing all around us with a swath of red clouds turned pink. To Wolverine, Doug said, and then he turned to me with tears in his eyes. We lose nothing by loving.
This is the hour of land. May each of us create beautiful acts of discomfort and disturbance, each in our own way, each in our own time, with the gifts that are ours. So thank you. That was uh, that was wonderful. Thank you for the opportunity um, to share space together. No, it's uh, you bringing us to that that point where um, compassion and discomfort come together um, is is uh, such a powerful thing to do in this moment. I had a question about the senses. Um, you mentioned the, the moment of Dinosaur National Monument, which is a moment when David Brower and the Sierra Club realized the power of photography, which of course is my great historical interest, in the environmental movement. And in some sense, uh, many of the lands that were preserved were preserved with the notion that they were, in the terminology of the Sierra Club, scenic resources. So it was very much a notion that they're value was primarily visual. And of course, one of the things about the national parks is you can't keep sound out, yeah. right? right? And there's you know, been wonderful investigations of that. But you talked a lot about the wind and the voice of the wind, and then you left us with music, right? So I was, I was just thinking about this relationship between the parks and the senses, and what you can keep out and what you can't. And I just wondered if there's anything that you could say about in the experience of writing this book did you know did you have thoughts about about how how our senses are engaged in the national parks it's such a great question robin um and i do think that our national parks are a sensual experience um, i would even go so far as to talk about an erotic experience in the traditional sense of that word that it does it is in, it's an embodied experience and the thing that I was struck by um, was that in every instance that we visited national parks, and Brooke and I um, went to many, many, the wind was the common denominator, um, both as, as an elegance of breeze and both as a terror. Um, you know, the Chinese say the wind will take your chi. And I mean, bitter winds in the Tetons or Yellowstone. Um, and a blessed wind, a hot wind in Big Bend, um, a blizzard wind in the gates of the Arctic, um, a disturbance at Gettysburg, where when you hear the myth or the story that the reason why there are so many vultures over the cornfields in their inebriated flight is because they still have a memory of, of the fields of blood, um, that when that breeze would blow through those furrowed fields, you felt the spirits of the dead. Um, so that was a very sensual experience. But the other um, common denominator was water and light on that water. In every instance, even in the depth of the desert um, on the, the borders of, of Mexico and the Rio Grande, you saw American children skipping rocks across the river to the Mexican children skipping them back. And you think, a wall? Really? these arbitrary boundaries um, that water keep reminding us. And I found just ritualistically, and maybe this says something about me, but I just had to put my hands flat on the surface of every 
single body of water that we saw, um, almost as, a, as an act of gratitude. And huckleberries, you eat them. Um, you know, sacred detura, you smell it and hope that some of those hallucinations will enter in. Um, when we were in effigy mounds, we took off our shoes as an act of respect um, to walk those bears, falcons, wolves. So I think it is deeply a sensual experience. And again, we forget that. You know, we live our urban lives, and um, I don't, we lose so much by our forgetting. And so when we remember, it floods us with an emotion. And I think that is another uh, sensory experience. And the last comment I would make is, I don't know how many of you have read um, this small, large book, The Collapse of Western Civilization, um, by Naomi Oreskes and, and Eric Conway. Have you read this? I loved how, when they talk about in the age of climate, it's written um, from the future back from the perspective of a Chinese environmental historian. And he looks at our moment in time, and he says, who were these people? They knew exactly what was happening. They had all the data. They had all the facts. And yet, they did nothing, except for those that had the most to lose. Not our lives, not the world that we love, but the corporations. And he says, the artist did not know or did not believe in the power of the emotional register. The scientists were too timid, and the public went to sleep. And so I think being in wild places, being in natural places, allows us to stay awake. Yes, Andrew. I want to follow up on the question around about the place of senses in this and the place of the environmental humanities. Um, in your response, what what part of what's running through my mind is that maybe the environmental humanities are not on are not giving what the scientists are giving us is more information. What else do we know about climate change? Um, and you mentioned in your, in, in your delivery that what is needed is a transformation. And could the environmental humanities then offer us a different way of knowing? Would, would you say that what is called for is a different way of knowing, not just merely what we know? I think that's beautifully put. And one of the things I love about the humanities and all its manifestations is the questions it asks not necessarily the answers that we seek. A different way of knowing, a different way of being. How would you answer that? And I would say to not lose that emotional register, to not take the ineffable seriously. That the spiritual element is substantial, a substantial, something that is substantial beyond the substantial. And we don't privilege that. And I would argue that's what makes us human. Hi. I'm also from the West. I'm from Idaho, so I'm really happy to hear you. As you were speaking, though, I was thinking about what is the uh, international focus to preserve wild lands and wild spaces in countries that are still developing, and we can see the like um, devastation of the resources and, and the lands that are happening there. So what is your response to that? Thank you for that. Um, it's interesting that the national park idea that is a global now idea. And I was just at the World Rangers Conference, which was really fascinating, and it was a revelation to me. And the leadership was largely, largely coming 
from countries like the Congo, um, Cameroon, um, Thailand, uh, Taiwan, um, Argentina, lands that where they are in conflict with um, oil and gas development, again with fossil fuels, and it is the indigenous people who are taking up the cause. Um, so that what we saw happen at Standing Rock this past week with the tribes, over 200, supporting no pipeline and a stay from the United States government in honoring that, we're seeing globally all over the world, whether it's in the Amazon, whether it's in the forests of the Congo, um, with rangers, many of them women, taking unbelievably bold stances. Um, I think of one woman in particular in Cameroon who was fighting against the, um, the poachers. And she had galvanized members of her community to help her. And at one point, um, the poachers uh, assaulted her, raped her, and thought that they would um, do everything short of killing her so that she would no longer speak. She is speaking. And to me, it's the indigenous voices, it's the local voices, it's the voices on the ground worldwide that are really um, doing the frontline direct action. Oftentimes, that may not be a politically correct answer, because I think there is a deep tradition of colonialism that we are a part of. But I think if you look deeper, um, the climate justice movement and the movement that E.O. Wilson is calling for of half the, the earth to be protected is gaining tremendous traction because it is ultimately the open space of humanity, democracy, breathing space. Yes. It sounds like uh, from your experience that you described when you were eight years old that um, a sense of the divine uh, and sense of the sublime really uh, is essential to a deep and abiding connection with the earth. Uh, and do you see uh, the environmental humanities or a place for the environmental humanities in trying to provoke the sublime uh, in a sense uh, in today's culture and very domesticated lives that we live uh, and how, uh, if so, how uh, can we try and provoke that, that sublime feeling? Um, I love the word provoke. I think that's really useful. And I think that notion of humility comes to mind. Um, we can be pretty arrogant as a species. And again, it goes back to that notion that we are not the only species that lives and breathes. And I would argue grieves on the planet. Let me answer this with a story, and then perhaps that can be the closure of this gathering, which I'm so grateful for. Brooke and I were, what, how to say this? Um, we've been married 41 years, and last year we celebrated our 40th anniversary, which was in and of itself miraculous. And we both said to each other, where do we want to go to celebrate? And instantaneously what came out of our mouth was Yellowstone. And we went north to Yellowstone, up into the Lamar Valley, which is right on the border of, of Wyoming and Montana, in the corner up by Mammoth, if you've been there. And we got up before dawn. It was that wonderful crepuscular hours where um, the shadows um, are still among us as the first light of day is coming. And as we looked in the Lamar Valley and we could see the mist rising from the Lamar Villa, uh, River, we saw this mound. And with our binoculars closer examination, we saw that it was a carcass, a bison carcass. And as the light started to stream in with dawn, we saw there were two coyotes um, scouring bones. There were several eagles uh, also cleaning bones and uh, a flurry of ravens. A ranger arrived, told us the backstory that the day before, this mother bison was in the process of giving birth to a stillborn. She was struggling, the calf was already dead, and the Lamar Valley wolf pack came in and they took her down. It was a quick and violent death, predator prey. We continued to watch the carcass. Suddenly, the hackles on the coyotes were raised. 
the eagles flew and the ravens disappeared, the coyotes gone, and out from the lodgepole forest we saw this magnificent white wolf, alpha male, walk around, enter the carcass for maybe an hour, devoured what remained. From our perspective, we could see that stomach swell. In time, the wolf pulled out this bib of blood and disappeared as quickly as he had appeared. We left, went on our day, came back at dusk, hoping that we could see that same wolf. There was the scaffolding of bones shimmering, last light of day. And we noticed about two or three hundred bison a quarter of a mile away. Suddenly, seven bison in a straight line, single file, evenly spaced, walked toward the mother bison. They circled her once. They circled her twice, tightened their circle, pawed her body, sniffed her body, nudged her, and lowered their heads circled one more time, and left as they came. Straight line, evenly spaced, save one lone bull who stayed with her. We are not the only species that lives and loves and breathes on this planet. Thank you.